I spent 50 years growing from a hamlet of 10 people to a lordship with thousands, all to help them get bloody vengeance on the high king that wrongly banished them. This is Songs of Six, an incredibly fun and beautifully deep fantasy city builder. But you don't need to know the game to watch these tilapi, a race of xenophobic, drow-like hippie, terrorize, cannibalize, and industrialize their way into being a threat on the world stage. The tale of Rovian Minen starts with a town center they hobble together with everything they own inside. The surrounding land is as fertile as it is expansive, and they begin to harvest wood for future buildings, tilling a farm on the fertile soil next to the nearby river, and clearing space to build a large pen for aurochs. These are basically cows that the Talapi excel at raising for their meat and leather. Planning a carpenter to make furniture for future workshops and homes shows the modular design for Songs of Six's buildings. A carpenter isn't some static 3x3 building or workshop, it's whatever the architects make space for, then fill with workbenches, storage, and tool stations that determine how many people can work there and how efficiently they do it. Though the xenophobic Talapi would prefer to only recruit their peers from the eight playable races in this this game, they accept the petitions of a few humans that want to join. Tilapi make for great herders, archers, and woodcutters, but humans are excellent farmers and researchers, which improves their yields at those jobs, and so the Tilapi hide their disgust to get the humans to work the farms they're almost done plowing. Once the fields are ready, they laugh and send a 10-year-old kid to start working, but child labor laws won't be invented for another few centuries, so it's morally okay. Rovian Menon needs a productive industrial quarter to ever have a chance at growing into an international powerhouse. That starts with an expansive warehouse that has enough storage crates for the foreseeable future. Goods stored here are also visible in the menu on the right, helping me keep track of stocks and any upcoming supply shortages. The local area is scoured for forage that can fill it, as summer ripens wild plants like the fruit to the south and the cotton to the southwest. Both the food and tailoring industries they contribute to are going to be aided by the completed auroch pen, which is filled with most of the livestock they brought with them. Hopefully that helps soon, since the ration stores they brought are quickly dwindling. To address that better, the tilapi prepare a pen for pigs that are only good for their meat and a fishery on the coast of the river. Their protein-heavy diet will be perfect for soldiers that swing swords and shoot arrows, which is all they'll have to get vengeance against the Kingdom of Usurpators to the west. That'd be a lot easier if they had access to the more than 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships you can pilot in this video's sponsor, War Thunder. It's the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Fully detailed and modeled components allow for incredible customization and destruction in immersive combined arms battles with other players. I love dogfighting because the game's easy to pick up mouse controls make outmaneuvering an enemy and leading my shots just right so cathartic. The dynamic damage system where hit shred individual parts instead of a generic HP bar makes this even better. Play for free right now on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. New players and those coming back from a break should use my link in the description for a large bonus pack that'll give you a premium account, premium vehicles, and tons more. Back in Rovian Menon, people want an industrial kitchen to cook for them, and that requires clay ovens. So some workers start preparing to dig out clay near deposits by the river to the east. Since each season is just four in-game days, unfortunately, hot meals aren't quite ready before winter's chill arrives, and while the snowfall eventually melts, the chill killed someone off-screen, which may be because I still have a lot of homeless people and not very many clothes for anyone. One final snowstorm blows in from the north while everyone works to construct apartments, and Spring's Bloom is accompanied by shovels breaking ground to work on a tailor that will craft auroch leather into outfits before next winter arrives. Hopefully no one else will have to be buried in the solemn mass grave nestled into the eastern forest. At least not because of the cold. I don't doubt that the specter of death will be back for other reasons. That's the first of many, many 
many years to come, and the town of Rovian Minen has grown from 10 to about 30 people thanks to desperate immigrants just happy to have a meal. That means the town can technically plan for a small military, though that is not in the cards anytime soon. Even building a bowyer to equip Talapi, who are naturally skilled at ranged combat, requires a lot of research that will have to be done at a laboratory kept in the center of town. It'll be staffed by humans since they're very good at this, and the good Talapi need them to be centralized to keep an eye on them. The nearby ranches are perfect to watch them from, though the pigs are replaced by another set of cows since the food stores seem fine for now, but tailors are always asking for more leather. It's a good thing those humans are being watched. They're outright saying, I'm not a racist, but... So who knows what they say in private while huddling around the fire to survive the second winter. And at least this one doesn't kill anyone. The frozen ground is hard to dig in, and so instead of presumably going in ditches in the forest, the architects finally add basic bathrooms that everyone's needed for a while. Especially since they've been eating a ton of meat and not very many veggies or a or proper cooked meals just yet. Clean pants cannot be in high supply here. This is the first real service that they're afforded, though there are tons of these that will require more resources and more research. Every race has different needs, preferences for things like religions and food, and desires for other races to keep as either peers or slaves. There's a huge amount of depth here, and you can drastically change each run just based on who you accept in your village. All of this is required to be managed to keep people happy, which will get them coming here as the the village grows larger and larger, and their expectations swell in turn. The second year nears its end with a population of 60 people, which means more hands for research, but more mouths to feed. The empty pantry is going to be supplemented with replanted wild fruit at a new farm, and a hunter shack that will employ the brave and the foolish alike who risk fighting wild beasts for the plentiful meat they offer. But where the humans see a problem in those that die to the creatures, the Lopi see solutions. Right now, the growing village is located on the north of the river. Humans keep to the farms and labs there, and the Talapi are happy to assign them only to those jobs, even though they themselves travel to the south side to harvest wild plants. And while the Talapi could bury that corpse, they really like cannibalism. It's easy to say that the special meat pies from here are just fresh auroch steaks. Instead of questioning that, humans should ask scientific questions questions. They continue to amass written material, but there's so much to spend it on. New production facilities, efficiency improvements to what they already have, improved military tactics, infrastructure like physicians, and so much more. The first technologies improve the efficiencies of ranches and farms, plus remind everyone how to fire clay into pottery. That'll use up the first of the tens of thousands of research points the humans will eventually generate here, but doing so will require tons more, since research degrades over time, and the total amount you can store is related to how many total you have working, and that in turn requires a lot more tilapi to keep an eye on them. Keeping the hippies happy is the number one most important goal right now, and for the moment, they complain about the boxy buildings. Apparently, circles are more organic. It's why the new pottery is a large circle with a central pillar, which is admittedly a lot harder to fit workbenches and tools into. But that won't just keep tilapi happy. I'm always happy to see a game encourage you to use more than just efficient but boring squares. Happier citizens mean more migrants, and between this change to all future buildings and other joys, the city crests a hundred people before the third year ends. Though with that milestone, the Talapi do stop allowing humans for now to avoid being even close to being outnumbered. Attracting more murder hippies requires more than just round buildings. They want doctors, and while the furniture would fit into a circular building pretty easily, 
Doctors need actual tools to do their job and to have a physician built. That's at least a few technologies away, since the humans haven't even figured out how to smelt ore down into metal ingots yet, much less how to build a smithy to craft all of that into tools. While researchers start looking into that process, scouts find that there are no deposits near the town, but that there's plenty of coal and ore veins nestled against the mountain to the far south that everyone starts drawing straws for to figure out who will be making those long trips. Even with the basics in, the multitude of things required to keep people happy seems so far off, though that is a wonderful challenge to have. The tilapi want more trees so that they feel like they're living amongst nature, to eat people, and more organic rounded buildings. What the humans want doesn't matter nearly as much, but they might enjoy the paved roads their research unlocks. These speed up traversal and help keep things clean for everyone, while architects try leaving space for trees to go in, in between buildings. It isn't much, it's no forest for sure, but it is a decent stopgap before realizing the more vocalized demands, which are things that will require much more research, like arenas and temples. And the trees really do make everything look a lot nicer from above. I love that the game outright encourages this kind of decorative building. It makes watching ponds scurry about as they get on with their day even better. It's also slowly working for the tilapi, and they're liking their environments more, but would love to eat some eggs. A globbed in pasture will take care of that down to the south. These are some kind of egg-laying lizards. They don't provide as much food as other options, but the variety helps with happiness, and the tilapi are skilled enough at ranching to make up for that inefficiency. The quarries finish being laid out to the far south, but it'll take a while to build up the large stockpile of ore needed to actually build anything that requires metal, and so human ingenuity instead overlooks smelters and focuses on unlocking weavers to turn plentiful wild cotton into fabric. Some of the cotton is replanted on a farm to make sure the supply is both steady and can grow in tune with the city's needs, though food itself is starting to look scarce too. With good farmland growing rarer and rarer, another hunter is laid out south of the river. When planning buildings throughout the city like this, roads are made along natural footpaths as citizens go for far off items like mines, and then buildings themselves are wedged into where they'll fit between roads to give a more random and organic look. Back on the more industrious north side, humans figure out how to smelt ingots out of coal and ore before the architects prepare a place for both weavers and smelters. Even if maximizing how many people can work in these important buildings is difficult when they're so oddly shaped in this limited space available. The smelter goes through ore faster than it goes through coal, and so more miners prepare to go after the metallic glints than those dark hues. At the same time, the larger city with more fancy production buildings is starting to go through furniture faster than the lone carpenter makes it, and so a second one goes in alongside these newer buildings. This is the first of extra production buildings that are needed to scale past what the initial smaller ones limited by resources at the time were able to put out, though eventually pretty much every resource building will be duplicated, triplicated, and so on. Despite worries about a scarce food supply that an imminent harvest should fix, more tilapi want to join. They can help keep a larger human population in line, and the town itself hits 150 people total, which officially unlocks the justice system. There's room for an executioner's area and public stocks near the river, and it is a total coincidence that this seems to prioritize access to the special quote-unquote Orok butchery to the south of the river. The humans hit a snag though. They run out of space to actually store what they've been working on in the lab, and more written material deteriorates as fast as they can produce it. That ultimately necessitates building another lab that'll eat all of the furniture that both carpenters make for at least a short while. The tilapi's distaste at being bossed around for how their goods need to be used manifests in complaints about the lack of pardoned prisoners, even though there are no prisoners in the first place. 
At least the Talapi are enjoying the environment more and more as trees are added near paths to improve their sense of harmony with nature. The higher percent of round buildings as more are added for newer industries also helps them feel at home. They still want for roads, which will hopefully be accomplished by a major highway being built from the southern tip of town all the way down to the mines which will hopefully also speed up how fast miners walk back with their harvest. Though their fast work does sometimes backfire, since the architect accidentally told them to build dread roads and not normal stone ones. These are apparently terrifying, which should hopefully keep any criminals away. Despite concerns over the growing numbers of humans, a fresh wave pushes the town over 200 people, and with the second lab now fully staffed, it isn't long before the work there allows the Tilapi to build a smithy. The first one they plan is truly magnificent, fit to forge all kinds of gear to destroy usurpators. It is the magnum opus of metalworking, but it's also stupidly, prohibitively expensive. There is something wonderful to be said about a game that makes it too easy to want to build big and fill out these grand buildings you carefully fit with just way too much stuff. I'm not even surprised that knowing I should try to be building smaller doesn't stop me from running into the same problem when I try to build the first retirement home and have to scale that back too. It really just makes me want to build a bigger city with more resources available so that I can make these grand dreams a reality. After a brief scare about food before summer's harvest is here thanks to all of these new mouths to feed, a bakery goes in to turn wild harvested grain into bread. I want to emphasize that the sped up clip of me actually designing this was originally two full minutes long. Something in this game just makes it so incredibly fun to design anything. I'm doing this for every building I put in and just editing it out, but good god, more games need to use this style instead of having static workshops and buildings. Even with the second lab going, the new researchers there are almost at the limit of what they can store once again. The research they've done helps improve carpentry to prepare for a bowyer, improves animal husbandry to make ranches even more efficient, and figures out how to properly nail wood together into a stage to entertain citizens that goes near the open plaza. Finally, they figure out how to turn fabric into clothes instead of relying strictly on leather goods. Though, since tilapia are so good at ranching, it's unclear how much that'll actually be used. Industry continues to expand westward with a sprawling and inefficient, yet oh so pleasing aesthetic as more and more of these round workshops are added. But their dreams of vengeance require more people, and getting more tilapi here means keeping them happier than what the current amenities afford. Letting them store some pottery in their homes will help, even though it does eat into the supply and requires a potter to constantly offer more to them. Allowing them to retire for the last couple decades of their natural lives will help too. The diversity of things you can do in this game to improve happiness really seems like it can lean well into making runs different. A village with more clay and wood might make furniture and pottery to keep their citizens happy, while one with more farmland might have more food and drink rations to give them, plus leather to turn into clothes. I'm interested to see if an endgame town can sort of do everything on its own, but I'm really guessing that it won't be able to at this rate. Continuing to grow the village's production capacity beyond on what it can handle now, really needs metal bars for more advanced workplaces like a bowyer or masonry. The metal is also needed to make necessary items like tools, and upgrade current buildings like the lab to make them vastly more efficient. The best way to do that right now is to expand mining capacity to stockpile more of the ore that goes into actually making them, and that's what most of the idle hands go towards. Simpler industries might not need that metal, but they have drawbacks of their own. The hunt makes a lot of meat, but a dying woman does come in after being mauled in the wilds while that meat is being prepared for hauling. I don't even think the cannibal is cutting up the dead hunters, since it seems like it's restricted to operating on dead outsiders and criminals. The last research that can be stored in the current labs is used to unlock stone cutting and a masonry, though construction turns towards making more labs first. Since a masonry requires metal bars to be built, and more miners are still working to prepare to tap one of the last ore veins in the local area to help make the smelter more productive. More bars still will be used now that the smithy's done, 
and while it will eventually make weapons and armor, for now, they only know how to forge tools to use at the physician and other specialized buildings. The dearth of metal means that while humans want to unlock an upgrade to their labs to improve their research and how much they can store, it's ignored because those renovations would be too expensive. But even considering using metal to improve the human workplaces instead of the tilapi ones draws the gods ire, and so their research is instead directed towards unlocking temples, which is kind of a strange thing to have to research. Presumably they ought to know what kind of temples the gods they worship like. Of the four main religions, most tilapi worship Krator, the god of farming and animal husbandry. And if it's the only church, both other tilapi and the humans will eventually convert. Though actually building a beautiful temple requires cut stone prepared at the masonry that has been unlocked but still hasn't been built because that too needs metal bars. The remaining research points are poured into the mines since the smelter is perpetually waiting for more ore, but time is the biggest barrier to most improvements now and the village population starts to stall out as nearly every project calls for the shiny stuff. It might help to move the smelter closer to the mines, since that will mean hauling coal and ore half as far, and it's easier to make the long trek with a few even bars instead of unyieldy handfuls of ore. Tilapi already built a warehouse at the Y junction to the far southeast of town, where miners split off to their various mines. Unfortunately, building that smelter still takes time, and the stagnating town draws reckless acts of petty vandalism and theft from boards and unhappy citizens. It angers the others, but a guardhouse to actually handle the lawbreakers costs cut stone and requires guards clad in armor, both of which are best done with metal ingots. I guess would-be criminals were eventually going to realize that the stocks and executioner's blocks just aren't that intimidating without anyone to actually enforce the law. Despite having plenty of available housing, some 40 workers say that they're homeless. It seems like it's mostly those working the distant mines who want to live near their work. So by turning on the homeless overlay and looking for yellow workplaces, builders know where to prepare suburbs on the city's outskirt to surround the city itself. Though it's not the lack of homelessness and is instead last year's crime spree randomly ending that improves moods enough to draw the first migrants since last winter. Their hands will help work at a completed masonry using some of the first metal bars, which cuts stone into elegant blocks for fancy buildings that'll improve moods further to hopefully draw even more migrants. There's plenty of nearby stone littering the ground to feed it for now, but a stone mine goes in to harvest more sustainable deposits further to the north for when the non-renewable resources around them run out. The first cut stone is obviously going to go towards a temple to Krator. The first draft is grand and wonderful, but it's also stupidly expensive. The tilapi are eager, but they're also poor and they should cancel such a reckless plan. But don't they deserve it? Krator deserves it. It's staying to stand strong as a proud monument, a sign to usurpators that the exiles are strong and only growing stronger. Uh, ev eventually. The masonry will take most of a year to actually make all of that cut stone and drain everything in the stockpiles to even finish the church. But why even bother stockpiling cut stone? It's better to turn it into something grand than to let it gather dust. But since the city is getting bigger and grander, it's going to start drawing threats. Proper metal weapons and armor would be great, but metal is still limited and going towards industrial buildings like a bowyer. So melee soldiers being supported by naturally skilled tilapi archers I imagine will be doing most of the heavy hitting are going to be equipped with makeshift stone spears and leather gear. Fitting out an army with the crude gear is time consuming and resource intensive, but it only uses more easily accessed resources so it'll do for a small militia that dreams of proud metal gear. Another tailor goes in on the south side of town, since most of the leather comes from the pens there, and will work exclusively on preparing it into proud armor. While considering the military, I want to have a dedicated area for the military, and since I'm imagining that the city will be walled in with gates to the far southeast and northeast to allow miners out of the city proper, the military is going to go near 
the Northeast. A warehouse there will store the military's armor and weapons, while an archery range and training ground nearby will work civilians into recruits and recruits into soldiers. That's going to take a while to construct, though hopefully it won't be too late for when they're needed. The town hits a total population of 350, unlocking nurseries so that they can start raising proper children instead of relying strictly on immigrants. Since baby tilapi only eat fruit, production of it is further expanded with another farm and an orchard near the river. The trees at the latter take longer to grow, meaning that it'll be a lot longer before there's actual harvest, but make much more food per year and per worker once ready. At the same time, the move towards more sustainable production involves placing the first woodcutter. That'll do a better job in the long run than the current cut and build over its strategy that they've employed so far. The rest of the city continues to rack up improvements too. All of the recent buildings mean a need for more furniture, and with one of the two carpenters making crude weapons and not tables, a third is installed in the repurposed building that housed the old furnace before it was moved further south. Some of that furniture, plus tools made at the smithy now that metal bars aren't quite bottlenecking everything, go towards the first physician's office near housing and the military quarter. The improved city still has some problems. Problems. Among them is food. Hopefully the soldiers aren't amongst those that have willingly chosen to diet for their summer bods a little bit too early so that all of the needed farms can be planted. The archery range is finished and dozens of tilapi immediately start practicing with the bows that they're so good at picking up. In the rush to find volunteers that will eventually wreck usurpators, they signed on too many soldiers and so the force cuts back from 50 to 15. There's always a need for more workers though, and so more migrants are allowed in despite limited pantries. Since metal bars are still fairly hard to come by, the first upgraded building is a smelter, which immediately improves output by 50% with the same input and labor force. Maybe that'll build a surplus to prepare a stronger army, but for now, sticks and stones currently used for weapons to break bones are used to provide training grounds that will prepare melee combat still struggling on their empty stomachs. Bellies don't grumble for too long though, before summer's harvest arrives and helps to fix it. The vegetables are ready when the pantries are outright emptied, and that lasts everyone until the much larger fruit harvest comes just a day later. But though starvation isn't a threat at just this moment, the next one immediately looms like some kind of end of the season cliffhanger. Purported peacekeepers, likely sent by usurpators themselves, act in instead like common bandits, as they demand we pay them protection money. But to Tilapi, who are thirsty for true justice from their former abusers, the idea of entertaining these vile folk leaves an even worse taste in their mouth. If they want to be warmongers, they can die by the sword. The military reports that training is still slow, and the recruits are very amateurish. Their gear, which is assigned by these ticks, is also lackluster. In this game, there's no quality or even different materials at this stage. A sword is a sword, regardless of how it's cobbled together. But recipes that use metal are much more productive. Giving a soldier more gear means that they do better regardless of its source, so that efficiency is easily able to make a huge difference. Despite the fact that it's Tilapi preparing to go to battle to keep everyone safe, the humans aren't content. They argue that their research is being used for practically everything at this point. They want rights, and though the Tilapi refuse to make them equals, they do at least let them venture south of the river, if only to grow more food on the shore, while they're made to swear not to look into that Orok butchery. Complaints that it isn't enough are met with condemnation of being so demanding when violence is here at the door. Angry shouting doesn't stop the discussion from being tabled, though that peace could be shaky. The soldiers are able to ride out to the west and fight the enemies far from the city's lack of walls, but with inexperienced and poorly geared troops still getting much better every day, the few days it'll take the attackers to march closer might make all the difference. It also means keeping the troops close in case those humans get ideas. The fights will be close, but that's nothing new for Rose 
Barovian Minute. The pantries are still skimpy, there are various resource shortages, and more advanced goods are perpetually needed. None of that is fixed before some 40 bandits show up to attack the city itself. The south they're coming from is a fairly open plain that the small militia draws up into on a tight formation. It's the best spot they're going to get to fight in, since trees won't stop archer fire. Night falls as the first Talapi soldiers arrive. They can barely see what's in front of them in the dark much less any enemies, but they all steadily advance southwards to meet the foes before they get too close to the city. The early morning's dawn gives them just enough light to see foes setting up siege weaponry through the tree line. Melee soldiers advance to try and destroy that while archers enter range to cover the melee fighters who encroach, but doing so reveals the enemy combatants behind those builders. The melee fighters pull back and give the archers clean shots. Enemies step into range prompting staring fire please please fire you're on fire at will and we're told to attack anyways the melee soldiers just let enemies wander past too they finally get on the archers and start cutting away while enemy soldiers charge tilapi archers who fire into them the kills they notch force those friends to tread over them and their morale weakens until they break before they do too much damage this angle is perfect for archers, and though they miss a lot of shots and even have some friendly fire because they lack experience, they eventually manage to push off most of the enemies with only a few casualties of their own. Melee fighters are able to push to the trees and destroy the catapult before it can rain fire on the city, causing what's left of the enemies to break. They surrender instead of being cut down, leaving 32 war prisoners above a field covered in blood. With poor gear and poor training, the soldiers did more injuring than killing, but at least the bandits were easy enough to break and send packing. There are plenty of islands that would make for a fine prison, but no one can build a bridge over the thick water, and instead, a small jail is put near the cows. Even if it costs a lot of metal bars that there still aren't ever enough of, it's important to lock these guys up. Other species can be executed freely, though without a prison in place, most of those war captives are able to flee. Those that are caught are led to the stocks and summarily executed, which ought to offer the first chance for the special butchery to the south, but one of the workers there is a human mad at the tilapi, and he claims to be a conscientious objector. They drag corpses to the disabled grave and not their butchering table. Never leave a human to do a tilapi's job. At least the military is still strong and in good spirits after their victory. There were a few injuries, but only one death and one person now fatally wounded. The soldiers will continue to get better and better geared over time, and victories should hopefully continue to come. The biggest lab yet is almost done, which has room for twice as many people as the previous ones, and there aren't actually enough humans here to fully work it. I really do like how research in this game is bottlenecked by being able to maintain it, whereas in most games it's a very linear acquisition of material, points, or whatever the equivalent is, while storage is basically a non-factor. I think this system would let you come back from disastrous defeats in a lot more realistic a way after your labs were burnt. More crimes continue trying trying to try the good people who are just hoping to build up a stockpile of extra food and so ask for a guard station. These are expensive, but just one of them covers the entire town with watchful guards who should help reduce crime and catch those that break the law regardless. It'll take a little bit to actually get them stopping hungry thieves, but the nearly empty pantries should be helped along by a mass of new ranches manned by new tilapi invited to build and work them. Between that, fruit trees planted a few years back that are finally ready for their first harvest, and a non-stop slew of pig pens added until there's finally a meat surplus again, food will eventually be addressed. It's nearly a constant struggle. As soon as a fresh wave of migrants come in and I forget to add food for one minute, it's a problem, which is really nice to see since other games food becomes almost automated and easy over time. Back in town, one of the first buildings, the original 
original carpenter is torn down. It was one of the few square workshops left, but the paper maker that replaces it will have rounded walls. Paper is used for diplomats abroad and for storing more research in a library that they don't have yet, but building up a stockpile cannot hurt. The eatery in this quarter still sees lots of use, so a second one is added down south near the smelter to feed both the miners and the ranchers who shouldn't have to make such a long trip for a meal. Fortunately, food production seems to have settled out, with meat stockpiles rising even in late spring when last year's harvest is all gone. But balancing workers and resources is so tight in this game that this surplus means another shortage, in this case leather because more recent pens have focused on raising pigs for food instead of cows for their hybrid food and leather output. But in general, things are looking up after the siege and a few close calls. The physician is done, though perhaps too late to treat some of the wounded soldiers. But that means that there are no buildings eating up the stockpile of metal bars, and one of tools can be built instead. The smelter is being worked full time thanks to a steady supply from all of the miners, and the fruit trees are blooming to produce more than twice as much as a similarly sized regular fruit farm nearby. There is an insane amount of research used to get some general improvements for food storage, production, and other efficiencies, with tons left for everything else, and it isn't long before the paper maker is ready to start preparation for an embassy, schools, and eventually that library. Beautifully wrought stone statues and pillars start to go in throughout the town to decorate it and help promote a sense of pride in the city, while the first lab is upgraded with stockpiled metal bars to double how much research it can hold. All of this is nothing short of a renaissance for the Talapi people and the first real tangible steps towards becoming a massive city that can reclaim what was stolen from them by the Empire. With some help from humans who maybe aren't as smelly as rumors initially said. It's the kind of story that will be taught to newly born babies in the town's first school. Perhaps it's not exactly ideal that a brewery goes in the same time, but Eh, what's the worst that can happen mixing the first booze in 15 years with some pregnancy? Though it does kind of look like wet nurses are just stuffing apples in empty cribs and looking busy to collect their paychecks. With a new source of people here, it's time to start turning their attention back to those that wronged them. The aptly named capital of usurpators to the west drove them out so many years ago, but figuring out more about them requires an embassy. That's what they'll call it to outside anyways. In reality, it's more of a spy agency. Perhaps Usurpator's spies are the ones that blighted all of the Aurochs, forcing hundreds to be cold. Fortunately, we just keep 500 animals in boxes in a warehouse with no windows in the middle of summer. Man, being a nature-loving hippie with a great record of animal rights is just fantastic. Though outsiders aren't to be trusted, their money could help buy supplies that may prove critical, and so an export depot prepares to sell off naturally gathered herbs and some of those excess animals for a little bit of money that'll be used to buy goods and hire mercenaries. Even if training goes well and the tilapia are strong, it's better to not need them to put their lives on the line. But since breeding must be difficult when it's been nearly 20 years without any opportunity for personal hygiene, beyond jumping in the river, they use 2,000 research points and a ton of resources to build a bathhouse near the nursery. Hopefully the better spells boost mood all around. The town watch catch their first criminal soon after. Well, likely criminal. There is no court for her to try her case at, and while she says she's innocent, that isn't going to be what decides her fate. Half the population clamors for a pardon, and half clamor for execution, and really, the most important thing about deciding such things is the morality of what makes people happy. Holy god, that is such a big mood boost. They'd rather someone just die than have extra meals in the pantry and in their belly. It draws more migrants than it has 
any right to. At least what happens to likely criminals is a good lesson for the first child able to attend school here after being born in the nursery. Everyone else has come from outside, as has some $80,000 from selling a few hundred crates of livestock. Oh, this game's too realistic. It even represents inflation slowly shrinking the coffers. Well-stocked pantries, aided by the last improvements to food production, support a huge workforce that just chews through new building projects. More labs, nicer food production buildings, houses, farms, more production buildings, and pens all add to the blossoming city that adds 200 people in just a few years. Despite steady progress to most of the town, there's still lots to do to add to the armory and get that fully stocked. There are enough bows for now, but not enough weapons and not nearly enough armor for the 60 soldiers. Adding hundreds more to take on their enemies will take even longer, but it has to be done because a kingdom of some 8,000 people like usurpators must have more than a thousand soldiers fighting for them and vengeance against them still remains the plan. That one execution of the prisoner who was probably a thief spiked everyone's appreciation of the government so much that you can tell the exact moment the public forgot about it. That immediately prompts another one though. Imagine how happy everyone will be when the entire kingdom that wronged them are dead in bloodstained fields instead of some petty criminal. Trying to improve their happiness through more traditional means, like letting them have some furniture in their tiny rooms, rapidly depletes precious resources as everyone makes a scramble for the warehouses. If they had it all along, there wouldn't be such a sharp spike in demand that it can't be answered, but the carpenters cannot handle this, so only leather and fabric, which are huge industries kept afloat by farmers and ranchers, can be offered up to keep the people happy for now. Despite that, more and more migrants arrive as word of the city spreads further there's almost a thousand people here shortly before the 20th year since their expulsion. This huge population continues to invest in new technologies to improve smelting efficiency. The bars there have helped build up a good amount of tools that are finally used to improve the efficiencies of workers doing various jobs. Farmers, smelters, and miners are the main recipients. The 18 tools that go to smelters mean they're making 20% more bars, and those tools only slowly degrade, so this is something that definitely should have been done so much earlier, though there soon aren't enough tools for everyone as more clamor for this boost. But renown is not always a good thing. More supposed good guys are here, and while the coffers are hefty enough to pay them this time, the dungeon is awfully empty. Scouts out looking for these bandits instead notice an army from usurpators that number over a thousand though most of them are at least poorly equipped. Still, Rovian Minon has a long way to go before they're ready to take on that army, but if they can't handle some bandits, they'll never match up to a kingdom. The ones outside this capital may prove troublesome, but they're allowed to wait until they're finally ready to arrive to give the army just a little bit more time once again, and to allow time to execute one more prisoner for good luck. Oh, this one's actually being butchered for I think the first time too. Hurrah! Crimes against nature and decency! Estevan is the good kind of human too. They even go get another corpse to butcher right away. Despite the new source of food though, there's still people starving to death at the nursery. In fact, a lot of the nurses seem to be starving. They have food. There's plenty a few blocks away, but no. They're on some kind of hunger strike that doesn't have time to be addressed because the military tells everyone to shelter in place. 120 enemies are here to start causing trouble is somewhere. Scouts say they're in the forest to the north, which makes it hard to find them and makes the archers worry that their lines of sight in this fight will be terrible. The melee soldiers and archers split up to find them, and when the former does in the northwest, the latter are stimmied and rushing over by the same trees. Despite that, brave tilapis charge the siege weaponry as it sets up and prepares to attack civilians. They push off the builders and keep the enemy forces at bay until archers show up to help. The Talapi have better training and better gear now, 
and the archers fire strikes true so much more frequently than during their first battle. Shot after shot kills the foreigners, though some of the enemies return fire before the Talapi kill that first regiment of them. They're adept at staying hidden in the trees, plucking away at enemies foolish enough to be out in the open. Should the enemies charge at the source of the arrows whittling them down, the well-geared melee soldiers would close in behind them and make it their last mistake. The enemies break one by one, and though the defense did cost four Talapis their lives, the remaining soldiers eventually declare victory over the enemies. Most of the foes died, but there are still some 40 alive, of which 16 surrender and agreed to be taken prisoner. They might not do that if they knew what awaited them. It's the military's deaths and not the nurses' continued hunger strike that causes a graveyard to be built. War prisoners are either executed for their crimes to the cheers of the people, or sentenced to fight in the newly unlocked arena underway in the center of town, also to the cheers of the people. Unfortunately, that isn't enough for some of the Talapi, who see the response to the nurse's hunger strike as weak. It kills their loyalty since they view these as wrongful deaths because we clearly should have force fed them instead of letting them complain when they could have walked like three blocks and gotten food. This causes a mass exodus of angry dissidents that take the city from 935 down all the way to 811 in just one day. Nearly half the military deserted since they seem to be angriest of all about what happened while they were out fighting. Since most most of the deserters were Talapis, the humans even outnumber them for the first time. Fortunately, the remaining military is strong, and they keep any complaints about the government from getting too loud, but there's still a huge glut of unfilled jobs that are going to cause problems going forward. Labs and other non-essential workplaces are closed so that the remaining fields don't go unworked. It is enough to stop the decrease in loyalty and happiness, but improvements are slow. They don't forget the effects of the strike for a long time, though the remainders are at least happy that they've now got more amenities to themselves and the prisoners' fights in the center of town, which distract them fairly well. It's fitting that that focus on brutality is accompanied by research points going negative for the first time, since there aren't enough humans working in labs to maintain the research the previous generation compiled. Future workers will have to rewrite some of their books, but it has to be done this way to stop a lack of food and other goods from causing a death spiral in the city. The pulled workers are able to keep things steady despite the strife, and the perfectly happy and functional city, if you ignore the slaver being built to turn war prisoners into laborers, begins to attract more migrants to replace those that have left. They return to the once empty workplaces, necessitating more housing being put in, and the city continues to expand. Despite that, it takes a full year for sour memories to fade, though once it does, the mood-improving stopgaps take that opportunity to launch happiness up and draw more migrants until the city surpasses its old self and hits a thousand people for the first time. It earns the leader the title of Chieftain and unlocks administrative and law buildings. Unfortunately, while the justice-hungry Talapi would love a courthouse, building one requires gems, which seems kind of extravagant when those could just be adorned on to it after they're unlocked, but it'll still take the humans a short while to figure out how to do so, and they still haven't repaired those unkempt books. While the humans scurry about to handle it, industry is expanded in the south with more tailors, ration makers, smithies, and as payment for their good work helping the city during the strike, plus their general tolerance of the cannibalism that can't be kept secret for much longer, another farm. There's perpetually more need for housing as population continues to skyrocket, and it's kind of sad that they only get these impersonal longhouse blocks instead of actual homes. But there's never enough room, wood, or time to build better individual housing for a city that never stops growing. Oh no, not again. The nursery has more starving workers, 
An eatery is installed nearby to stop them from getting even a shred of sympathy. More are assigned too, so that the ones that work there have more of a break. Since the bathhouse near the nursery is overwhelmed and can't help anywhere close to everyone, a little forest retreat bathhouse is also added in. The promise of sinking into the spa has humans working twice as hard, and they get all of the research back from before they were unassigned from the labs in order to figure out how to best monitor gemstones without destroying them. That work also yielded enough results to improve yields in the other mines some 20%. And though they live in a forest, the mountain range just barely nipping into the southeast side has tons of gemstones to pick away at. If I were playing a less xenophobic race and didn't plan to go to war with nearby groups, I might even focus heavily on mining gemstones, then either selling them directly or jewelry made from them to buy most other goods. As is, the town continues to aggressively grow, adding another 100 people in a year while making sure the military gets a similar expansion to prepare for their eventual goal. It's hard to keep getting more and more people though. The meager fabric production has been so outpaced by the growing population that it can't be given to everyone anymore, and allowing them furniture just immediately tanks whatever stockpile is there, no matter how much they had built up. There's never much in the way of food in the pantry either, even though everyone would love to have more of that and a more diverse diet. Despite those concerns though, the growing city looks to its embassy to start constructing a spy network and expanding outwards. A couple of Talapi head to Usurpators, while one heads east to Blazin to potentially look into subjugating them. Tribute would make growing so much easier. The spies will find out valuable information about their population, economies, and more. Back home, the impressive research being done further improves metalworking and farming. The latter will help sustain a larger and larger population, which will in turn allow for a more powerful army, while the former allows upgrades to production buildings like labs and carpenters to make them that much more efficient. Upgrading the smelter further requires a heavy investment of bars and cogs, the latter of which have already been made at a nearby mechanic at great cost, but this is the single largest upgrade left to resource production throughout the town. The first gems are finally being mined, so after spending two full in-game days just designing the courthouse, it started precisely as the 25th year arrives, the town stands strong with some 1,250 people supporting all kinds of industry and upkeeping a strong military, even if it could do with being better equipped. Oh, and I guess everyone could use a little bit more food to stop starving. Needy bastards. More egg-laying lizards aren't quite efficient for that, but eggs are a good addition to also keep people happy, even if it eats into the excess livestock currently being sold off to afford imports. Foreign clothes are finally enough to start building up a proper surplus, but the only reason to have any is to spend them, and so everyone is assigned a spare outfit, and Tilapi immediately bum rush the warehouse to destroy what was there. With tool production on pause to save on metal bars, it isn't long before there's finally enough to upgrade the smelter yet again. It still uses every bit of ore that can be mined on the entire map to make some 20 bars a day, which will only slowly increase with better mining and smelting technologies. Before that, the human's work might have to go towards improving food production, as the gods curse the land with a drought that'll ravage the pantries further. It's divine punishment for focusing on the mountains and not the plains and forest, even if it is ridiculous to punish the Talapi when they do good deeds like butcher executed war prisoners. But the larger city is finally ready to outgrow its tiny little temple, and this is a good indication they need to. The first pasture ever made is torn down, it's practically a holy ground for Krator, even before a well-decorated temple is planned atop it. But the largest building in the city yet isn't nearly grand 
grand enough. So more rooms are torn down to allow an almost legendary temple to finally go in. This is almost prohibitively expensive, but who needs stone walls around the city when Krator's blessing protects far better? The city's growing continues to speed up. A year later, the population has grown from 1,250 to nearly 1,500. The court finishes and tries the first criminals to find them guilty, even though every last one swore they were innocent. Even the outsiders prosecuted just for being another species have to be tried. Perhaps that pursuit of justice and the new temple plans are why the gods now bless Harvest, promising to fill the pantries well. That's enough to start making headway on focusing on the military once more, first with another bowyer while metal bars are still used to upgrade food production buildings. It takes a full year before there is once more enough cut stone to actually start building the temple, but eager hands rush to finish it, and it only takes a few days for giddy worshippers to finally arrive. The old one is quickly torn down to make sure that everyone uses the new one, which is more than four times as grand. In more mundane news, Baker and Brewer's Row in the West gets a nearby granary to help keep them fully stocked. I definitely should be using more small warehouses like this to minimize how long workers spend walking. First though, the huge mass of people that recently arrived are put to work with more labs, lizard farms, and orchards. There's thousands of food in the various warehouses, but with so many mouths to feed, that's still not nearly enough to make people confident they could make it through a particularly rough winter. It probably doesn't help that homes are hard to come by, and so tons of people are still homeless, as more longhouses are only slowly added. The ever-growing economy is providing more and more for the military, as stocks of weapons, bows, and armor continue to rise to better equip larger squads. It's been a while since the growing city got some improvements to public services, so a pavilion goes in near the arena in the center of town, and the outskirts suburbs get sand wells, and other basic accommodations for those that work there to keep them from having to frequently make it back to the city. In the heart of Rovman and Proper, humans figure out how to better store their research in a library. The new temple continues to do its job and fills everyone's religious needs, but other jealous gods interfere and try to blight crops. They also strike the less pious humans with insanities that a small asylum will hopefully correct. There's no room for deranged people when they could be productive cogs. The more useful folk have almost finished equipping the entirety of the army. Carpenters making makeshift weapons switch to making more furniture instead to provide for other buildings and maybe to allow the citizens to have something in their homes. The rest of the town racks up improvements too. Metal ingots bought from wandering traders are used to improve breweries and bakers. More roads are added to this wonderful overlay of foot traffic, and the military gets another expansion to to start training even more soldiers. Wonderful places to eat are planned and cleared out land, and the library is redone, since no one seemed to want to work on the old one for some reason. In far more important news than nerd stuff for nerd humans, 1,000 tilapies now call this place home, and the population nears 2,000 total. It's taken 30 years, but the town is bustling and thrumming with life. It took 25 years to pick up 1,250 but just five years to pick up over 700 more. It might not be impossible to take on the Empire of Usurpators just 50 years after starting. The research that they'll need will be stored in the library, which finally has the hundreds of furniture, cloth, and cut stone that it requires. This employs 50 humans to increase how much research the town can store by some 30,000 points, compared to a lab that employs 48 and only stores a sixth of that. It does need to be filled out with scrolls and constantly supplied with paper, but that still will involve far fewer hands to get research done than merely working labs. The first research held there unlocks crypts, which are grander building sites. Unfortunately, they're far too expensive to use for most people, even if the general population would love for their friends and families to be buried there instead of in the simple graveyards about. 
Hopefully, the one graveyard so far isn't filled out with the military. The soldiers are well equipped, well trained, and would love to start marching out to test Usurpator's outlying settlements. That spike of morale is not enough though. They need drinks and food to keep them going. Ration makers will prepare the excess meat with herbs to turn them into longer lasting rations that can keep the soldiers fighting for longer and feed civilians in a pinch. The population of humans crest over a thousand too, but the Talapi population starts to stall out as their expectations grow and there aren't the goods or services needed to sustain them. Maintaining hundreds and hundreds of expensive sets of armor and weapons is difficult stuff, and perhaps too many of the 2,000 workers here do that instead of providing for citizens. The steady buildup of the supplies they'll need to venture out is only interrupted by a brutal murder. There's been a couple of smaller crimes lawmen have dealt with before, but a Talapi was killed by someone with a clear desire to stay in the shadows. They strike again just a day later, killing another Talapi. The guards don't know who did it, but they do have a suspect to vigorously question. Unfortunately, the sun doesn't even rise before the killer strikes again, clearing the battered rakes and further angering the Talapi, who are now victims of a racist serial killer that's the third in 24 hours. The Talapi demand action, and though it's nearly a waste of resources since other crime is fairly negligible, guard posts are constructed all over the city to ostensibly catch the killer, but realistically just make the Talapi feel better. In less grim news, the ration maker is doing wonders. Booze production is stagnated, largely because there's always a shortage of one of the ingredients. Right now, it's pottery, but it's sometimes grain and coal. Managing all three well enough to make sure there's enough to get a town of 2,000 blitzed is no easy task. But when zooming out from the micro problems of supply lines and serial killers, the town seems bustling and beautiful. It takes up about a third of the entire local area, almost half of which is just ranches and farms needed to feed everyone, and half of which is denser crafting buildings and services. More of the latter are built to try and offset anger over the killer, but another murder hits before they're able to start assuasion. Even if they did change their name from the silencer to the Black Widow, probably because I saved and loaded the game since the last killing. The guard posts supposedly built to keep the killer in check are still being constructed, though while that stone is scrounged together, builders continue improving access to basic things like bathrooms. The modular rooms mean that it's easy to nestle them into little corners and back spots left by other large rooms as these become more common in a larger town, which both looks and feels wonderful. I can't remember how having this much fun designing towns and workflows in a game in a long time. The food stockpile remains shaky, but improving how much they're allowed to eat with helps a ton with their mood, and the completed bathrooms will help them with the natural conclusion of those bigger meals. That doesn't stop the humans from being so pissed off that they actually organize a strike. Though scheduling a human to be executed is enough to get them back to work. That's totally because of their high morale and not fear. It's also enough to maybe, hopefully, stop the serial killer. Either way, they're gone and haven't caused trouble in a while, which is all anyone needs to feel better. Between that and the improved services, the first Talapi immigrants in years start to arrive to help construct a second asylum, since the first can't handle the ever-growing legions of deranged humans who are going mad for no discernible reason. Even though ranches make far more meat than eggs, the latter stockpile is growing much more quickly because they spoil much more slowly. I didn't realize it at first, but of the 1200 meat made per day, 300 just spoils. Since that's going to waste, increasing food rations will make people happier without actually causing any food shortage issues. Maybe people have been mad this entire time because they've had to go hungry while watching that food rot. With the humans happy to finally have a second ration though, their booze gets taken away. Since breweries right now aren't able to keep up with getting everyone drinks and stockpiling for the army. At least the logistics to actually supply them are fixed, so the ever-growing line of these are a paradise for microbreweries, as more are constructed to hopefully get the army so drunk that they can't stand. 
the homeless population continues expanding in tune with the city itself. So more longhouses are added in all over the city, and then more woodcutters go in to address that shortage. A jeweler, which is the last craft shop, is finally unlocked. Now, most of what's left in the tech tree is upgrades to existing buildings and small improvements to efficiency, though actually adding more shops total will generally make more of a difference than the little 10% bonuses here and there. More and more alcohol is made, which is stored at supply depots near the military quarter. These are easy to build and will supply armies as they go abroad. It still takes a full year for the expanded slew of breweries with an ample stockpile to work from, plus limited drink rations for all civilians to actually build up enough, but conditions continue to steadily expand. The copious grain stores also fuel bakeries that desperately try to keep up with feeding all of the humans. They swap to coal-fired ovens, which doesn't improve yield per grain, but does let them cook more bread per day, which will hopefully help them work through the surplus that has grain sitting on the ground when the next harvest is almost there again. I might have gone overboard with grain farms to try and supply all of the breweries. Perhaps now is the time for nobles, which are one of the few work in progress features that are a reminder that this game is still technically in early access. Some of the Talapi working in the Grand Church, like Kiara here, can be elevated to oversee things. Holy crap, they give a flat 10% bonus to all farms. 20% to ranches? I should have done this forever ago. No one will be the official master of baiting, but in total, seven Talapi are elevated to various royal positions that will boost production across the board by about 15%. It even makes the Talapi much happier to have Talapi nobles, so there really are no downsides I can see. The army supply depots are in and ready to be stocked with the gear, booze, food, and clothes that the army will need when they march abroad. But they're apparently too far from the breweries and warehouses for the lazy suppliers to actually go grab the items themselves, so haulers are installed. I haven't really used these much up till now, but someone working at each of these will fetch the assigned good even from a long distance away. Though in this case, they're only doing it so that the nearby supply depot can and steal it away. The industrial districts continue expanding in every direction to support the endeavor, as do farms further to the south. This massive sprawl cannot be the most efficient way to lay out a city, but between this and the nobles things, good god am I looking forward to fixing all of this on a second playthrough. Despite that, the stockpiles continue to grow and there are even little improvements, like more pillars and statues along the path, that show off the gradual accumulation of wealth in Rovian Minute. But more important than mere aesthetic, there's finally enough stockpiled booze to make the army march, meaning they now only need more clothes. That remaining booze surplus is immediately decimated when citizens are allowed to drink again, and the Talapi go through 1200 bottles of the stuff in just one day. It's a glorious celebration, the full effects of which won't be felt for about 9 months. The need for clothes won't be entirely handled by tailors here who make armor instead of outfits, but by selling caged animals to traders and buying clothes from them in turn. Though, given how much more armor is needed, plus the need to maintain a steady supply of clothes once we actually attack usurpators and cut off trade routes, more tailors do go in all over the city. Between those two arms working together, it only takes a few seasons to fill the supply depot with clothes, and finally, after after so many decades, Talapi soldiers head to the world stage for the first time. Only the 240 fully trained soldiers grab their gear and go, leaving behind 30 newer recruits who aren't yet experienced enough to join their comrades. They head not for the capital, but for the city to the south that won't have 500 garrison members plus over a thousand soldiers guarding it. The plan is simple, surprise attack this place, pillage it, and use the resources or the enemy can instantaneously see what's going on and send the army that's five times as big as ours back at Rovian Menet. The soldiers get the order to return home and defend it. Imports are halted to try and save up money for 
mercenaries. But though this Jalopies return in time to slip back in, enemy forces stop on the outskirts of the local area and stop all trade. The soldiers return to the city guard and nervously wait for an attack that doesn't come nearly as soon as expected. Perhaps the enemy aims to shore up their sole weakness. They outnumber us fivefold, but many of their forces are poorly trained and equipped, which can be seen by these little red bars that would be green if they were more of a threat. Amusingly though, all of the soldiers leaving freed up amenities for other people, which massively boosted happiness for a few days and spiked the population with 200 migrants in short order. Some of them will form the next squads, as the first ones start capping out at 150 people each. They can't be equipped well yet, but they might be before enemies muster up the courage. All of the carpenters stop making furniture to fit everyone's houses out with some, and switch to weapons for the new soldiers, while all of the tailors do the same with leather armor. But as days pass without attacks, the rest of the town continues to grow. Nervousness doesn't stop them from adding farms, houses, and infrastructure improvements. The booming brewing business even has enough of a surplus that everyone is allowed more drinks and they once more pour into the warehouse to chug the almost thousand bottles there in what might be an end of the world party. After a full year of enemy forces waiting, our allies withdraw, which begs the question, what allies? I don't see a gonna meet around, and I've never made an alliance with anyone, but the allies' departure allows traders to visit once again, so were they stopping them? Despite the confusion on Rovian men inside, the lack of allies is enough to convince the enemies to retreat, change course, and sail to the nearby port to attack. It's likely a little too late with enemies at the lack of a gate, but researchers still unlock artillery and the machinist opens up once again to make the cogs necessary for a basic catapult. At the same time, the military forms up. The enemy will be here soon and it takes time to grab all of their gear from stockpiles and head to the center of the city so that they can respond to attacks from every direction. After a few days, the enemies finally push in from the south, which is a blessing. There are few trees here, so the excellent archers have unrestricted lines of sight, unless the enemies start building catapults in the forest and force us in. Hundreds of enemy troops come up from behind them as our archers line up just in range of the tree line and melee soldiers stand in front of them to intercept charging foes. Tilapi archers start laying out their fire as soon as enemies peek through the trees. These are their forests. The melee soldiers advance, weathering enemy archer fire with only the occasional loss. They're horribly outnumbered, but they have way more gear and are outskilling the enemies, and it lets them start chopping through them with Krator blessed mercilessness. Just to the southeast, the archer's fire continues devastating enemies and leaves dozens of corpses before they can get much much closer. The Tilapi have actually already killed 200 enemies with minimal losses, and more keep dropping. Night falls, but the moonlight is enough for them to see blood spilled by their blows. The melee soldiers are bogged down and so surrounded that they can't move much, but their armor keeps them safe. Enemies try to charge past them at the archers, but die beneath hails of arrows. They are starting to run low, as seen by the tiny yellow sliver left on their ammunition bar, but the bowyers prepared them with enough to slaughter so, so many foes. The melee soldiers continue absolutely massacring whoever's in front of them. The enemy force came with 1200, and it's already less than half that. The remainders are starting to break at the sight of their dead friends. The day will be the Tilapis, but it isn't coming at a cheap cost like the previous fights. The Tilapi arrows killed hundreds and struck true, but they had less armor and were somewhat worn down by enemy melee foes and the enemy archers return fire. Fortunately, melee soldiers finish things off, then head towards the catapults to wreck them, then head towards the catapults to finish wrecking them. 1,200 enemies came, 14 survivors are left. 
It cost a hundred Talapi lives, most of whom were in the Yartrus, as the melee soldiers lost just 16 on their spree that killed hundreds. That cost is heavy, but this still stands as nothing short of the greatest military victory ever achieved in Talapi history, and it was done against the very army that kicked the city's founders out some 42 years prior. The war is far from over, but they have weathered this first attack. They aren't in any shape to counterattack right now though, and the enemy empire has far more people to start recouping their losses. The archer squad gets planned upgrades in the form of more armor to protect them from return fire, and a third squad is prepared that will wield both sword and bow so they can stand in front of the pure archers to deal with enemy soldiers that charge. But that's going to take time, and as new soldiers train up, the surviving Talapi have to deal with the dead. Talapi corpse join the more than a thousand enemies. A new graveyard is placed in a nearby natural grove in a forest. The city sprawl hasn't quite reached yet. There aren't as many hands to do it, since patriotic volunteers immediately want to fill out the military squads to start the long process of training into soldiers. And while not all of them will be allowed to do so, random jobs around the city will have to make do with fewer co-workers and some extra crunch time. The gods continue cursing the city, and though the army would love to venture out and enact justice, they can't. The old soldiers are slowly buried, and their friends start to mourn and hold funerals. The stench of death slowly leaves as more and more make their way into the ground, and the first migrants start to arrive. Humans do slightly outnumber the Talapi, but they've just been protected from a massive army by a much smaller force, so they aren't about to cause problems right now. Some obey out of fear. Others do it out of appreciation. More still, help the army as it grows to attack the enemies. Spies cite the recuperating Usurpator's force, though there are but a hundred soldiers now. They're currently even more poorly equipped and trained than the last enemies that came before them, so they would be slaughtered by these Talapi veterans. Bow production lags behind, since the dead soldiers' bows seem to have been lost, and so the largest bowyer yet is planned near the storehouse in the southeast to hopefully help Talapi venture out before the enemies can form up a more formidable force. Between between that and a new canteen to continue feeding people in the heart of the city, there is a huge need for metal bars once again. Normally, imports would solve that, but despite the city being open up to the world, all trade routes seem to move through usurpators, and they aren't about to let people sell to us. It seems there's room to the east, but I suppose the kingdom there doesn't want to piss off usurpators. More Talapi are sent out as diplomats to try and counteract the propaganda, but it's still not enough to make traders risk it. As more gear accumulates, the chance to go get even more through raiding starts to arise. Unfortunately, bandits hoping to find the city in a state of disarray and panic show up to try to raid them first. Now, even if traders did want to come, they would be blocked off. Though at least that part isn't too too bad, since the city does have plenty of raw resources to harvest all around them. Still, there's an army of some 500 decently geared and equipped soldiers out there waiting. The new bowyer is almost done, though it probably won't finish in time to equip more than a couple of archers. Combine that with their poor training, and I imagine the melee soldiers will be doing most of the heavy lifting. Assuming they survive these though, they'll need to do more to attack usurpators. Research has stalled out because more can't be stored in a library that never has sufficient paper, so more woodcutters are added to be transferred to a nearby stockpile and the papermakers around it. The new bowyer does much the same with space now that it's up and running before the attack arrives. Maybe that will be the difference maker for soldiers despite their poor training. Huh, there's separate bars for training and for soldier experience, so apparently butchering a force five times your size isn't worth much actual experience in combat, it's a nice system, though I wonder how much better true veterans perform. Since the enemies are close, and to save the trouble of mobilizing soldiers to defend the city, the soldiers ride out to meet their foes. All of them. Even though I hadn't planned on bringing the untrained and under-equipped hybrid squad. There's even a few catapults that civilians are setting up, though it will take them time to be built and loaded. 
The 500 enemies and the catapult of their own are to the south. Their squads have about half the maximum experience in gear, which is much more than the Usurpator's army, but isn't as much as our main squads, including the archers. The relatively inexperienced Talapis form a thin line in the back of the trees. They're guarded by the experienced melee regiment in front of them, and the inexperienced hybrid squad in the tree line to the east, hoping to flank any approaching enemies. This battlefield has good lines of sight, and the archers take shots as soon as the battle begins. They make quick work of foes because while they are less experienced, archery is in a tilapi's blood. The enemies try chasing the smaller squad, who retreat back to draw them further and allow the more experienced soldiers to march over and pin them in. The tight formation means there aren't gaps, and their heavy armor and strong weapons slice through even well-prepared foes. Archer fire butchers the other enemies, and it isn't long before the remainders flee. In the end, two Talapi died as they slaughtered 532 enemies. A well-geared force is almost disgustingly strong. And even better still, the enemies are looted for tons of gear that will fund the next raid. I wonder if there was something similar from defeating Usurpators, or if this only happens if you march out to meet the enemies. Despite the capital now being open, there is still no traders. That doesn't stop the supply depots from looking good, even before the returning army starts storing all of their extra loot. There is even enough ore in the haulers depot to expand smelting capabilities down closer to the mines to reduce how much is actually hauled up to the rest of the city. Before, it made sense to smelt halfway in to avoid this southern section being cut off by attackers. But now that the army can handle it and the city sprawl is almost here anyways, a new one gets placed right by the mines. It won't be work for now though, since without upgrades, it makes only half the output from the same input. Bowyers work to finish the arsenal needed to attack the oppressors, while another ration maker turns the now plentiful bread from wonderfully productive bakers into tack and rations for a larger and more active military. It isn't long before the thousandth bow is stored in the warehouse once more. That's more than two of them for every enemy soldier Usurpators has. A few more supply depots will help ferry thousands of meals, booze, clothes, and gear to soldiers abroad. They drain the local reserves as they fill up, but enabling the army to prepare to march once more is more than worth it. Though not many of them go. Only about a fifth of the archers show up. The other 120 died in the various fights, and those that have replaced them are still considered recruits, which means they won't go to war, and the aggressing Talapi number just a hundred and 80. The enemy army is almost up to 600, but they're still inexperienced and poorly geared, so the army feels confident going for them. Unfortunately, while they hang out on the city outskirts, going after them would mean also drawing the attention of the 500-some guards there, and without supporting archer fire, the roaming Talapi army instead heads south for Formin lore to start sieging it down in hopes the enemy army comes to intervene. They're too cowardly at first. It's the difference between Talapi and those backstabbers. There's no manual fighting for sieging enemy towns. Instead, you have to outlast their supplies and then auto-resolve a victory. That means you need to have enough in your supply depots back home to sustain their drinking, eating, and so on. But fortunately, that's not an issue. The threat of letting Talapi destroy the first city is finally enough to prompt the enemy army to move, and the friendly army leaves the siege to meet them in the middle of the nearby lake. The Talapi are heavily outnumbered, but most of those squads barely have the gear to be called soldiers, and this is flat terrain for the 30 veteran archers to take advantage of. Each enemy squad is made up of only one race, and of course the one without any weapons or armor is the Talapi squad. Usurpator's hate never ends. The enemies have little armor, but plenty of bows, and so instead of just drawing back and letting archers fire away, the Talapi soldiers draw up close and charge in to cut flimsy archers down. 
Without anything in their way, the 30 veterans also do a very good job of thinning the enemy forces. Though enemy archer fire returns some kills against the melee soldiers, it's vastly outdone by the damage from the Tlopi's outgoing fire, and enemies evaporate before the melee soldiers can really get into the thick of it. The last squad of archers is hunted down, but they break before they can be chopped to pieces. This fight did cost more lives than the last, but not by too much. Amusingly, they looted even less from the Kingdom's army than from those rebel bandits, because these forces were so poorly equipped. Usurpators is not ready to reform their army as much as they clearly need to to defeat the Talapi. The siege can resume. The enemy army is now just some 50 soldiers, and they can do nothing as the victory bar slowly ticks up over at Formanlor. Rovian Menon sees minor improvements to services and amenities over time, and after five days spent around the enemy cities, it's already so weak that the defenders give in with only token resistance. There's two choices for how much loot to take, since the left option is mercy that is definitely not in the cards. We can do a few things to the government too. Occupying it would mean overseeing a bunch of filthy people that aren't Talapi or human. And so instead, a few more sympathetic Talapi are installed in a puppet faction independent of usurpators. They owe a great deal to us, and immediately send some spoils of war on one of the few wagons left. The Talapi army starts to head back home where the beginning of a larger prison in the northeast near the military wing can start. This pre-modern day Alcatraz can be guarded by the returned victorious soldiers, who at least want to wait for the rest of the archers to train up before venturing for usurpators proper. That means there's time for more improvements to make this place safe from foreign nations who consider this righteous justice mere warmongering. Walls to the east protect the city. I actually really like how I'm starting to literally be unable to get what I want on the local map. Every stone node is tapped and every mine is maxed out, but even with improvements to their efficiency through research, there's still not enough, which forces me to trade or exploit other cities for what I'd want, or in this case, scale back. It's a nice touch most games don't do enough of. At least the bowyers are able to produce enough bows to fully arm the archers, meaning the hybrid squad can start to get them and train with them. Unfortunately, there are always more homeless people, since the city's up to almost 3,000 total. And while it sucks to have to cut down trees the Talapis want more of, they need room for military buildings. Vengeance is just a higher priority than mere harmony. The treasury has tons of goods now, but there's still the 2,000 animals they want to export at the trading depot. The Talapi traders say that no one has sent word that they're willing to come buy other stuff either. Officially, the economy's $600,000 came from trade but it definitely just came from sacking that city, right? It arrived right around when the military got back, so not very subtle. That money is not of much use though. The new town of Elias to the south will trade with us, but they're small and the puppet government only has a few bars they're willing to sell. All other trade would come through usurpators, and that's obviously not happening until we take them down. The newer archers continue training up to gain more skill, though the newbies are still nowhere near as good as the old veterans. News of the recent victory in the war that even usurpators can't fully suppress starts bringing huge waves of migrants, bringing the population up to nearly 3,000 and emptying most of the pantry for the first time in a long while. Ranches are added to the southeast, while huge new farms are built in the northwest to complement some ranches up there. The food situation is not as dire as it seems, since the new harvest of fruit comes soon after the last of the pantries are emptied, but fruit output does still need to be improved, unlike grain, which still has a healthy surplus before the harvest. All of this will culminate in more canteens and areas to eat in both the far northwest and the far south, since that's where workers are concentrated right now, and they'll be more productive if they aren't walking as far, plus happier, for the option of having better restaurants. Restaurants. Production finally starts to shift away from armor. The stockpile says there isn't quite enough for all of the squad's needs, but that doesn't count what's in the supply depots, and so tailors instead start making clothes that the Talapi will be happy to see, since what they have now must be nearly threadbare from these war rationings. 
Only a couple tailors continue making armor to make up for what's lost to degradation and maintenance. Even more farms are added as the food problem persists, but really? Isn't that only one way to get more food? The supply depots are filled, the armies march out, and they immediately find that a caravan from the east passes through the river to trade with the oppressors while acting like they're the warmongers. The archers still aren't trained enough to march out, so only 150 soldiers do. But given that Usurpator's army is just 300, the Talapis are not scared. They march west of Usurpator's capital and start sieging the last support in the area. There's still hundreds of troops at home too, so it isn't like the enemy army can leave their citizens behind for a counterattack. The gulf will continue to grow now that the second metal smelter is upgraded and worked, meaning that there's going to be plenty of metal bars to prepare stoves at new canteens in the west and north that'll soon have forcibly imported food to serve. Meals stained not with sweat, but with the blood of your enemies just tastes better. It also means smithies can continue making more tools, thus allowing an even wider range of workers to be more efficient. Though it's still mostly just industrial labors that get them and not even close to everyone. Hopefully that'll help stock the warehouses at home with more key goods, like clothes and booze. Since supply depots are taking a lot for the soldiers abroad, they really need to end this war soon to help the economy recover. Traders continue passing the city by, further damaging it, while Usurpators literally gets tribute from nations they subjugated, such as the power of being a big bully. And at least the first siege of Talanashta is done. Given the small size of the Talapi army though, they return home instead of setting their sights on usurpators or the army parked outside. The fact that we stole 4 million from the city kinda does lend some credits to the idea that we're the bad guys here, but those are valid war reparations. They don't need things like food. Instead, that should help the canteens back home and tide everyone over until the new fruit farms are provided. It'll have to last everyone until the army is trained back up to head out and find more food, which means until the archers are all, or at least mostly trained. The melee troops have picked up soldier training too from their marching and battles, so almost all of the 150 Talapi there are amongst the strongest and best armed troops in the world, with fantastic gear, training, and experience. The Usurpator's army comes to help give the rest of the troops more experience. Their forces are incredibly poorly geared, with none really having more than two ticks of gear, despite some decent-ish training. Our hybrid squads are better equipped and trained than their melee ones. However, this territory is awful for us. There's so many trees that the lines of sight for archers is going to be horrible. The melee squads in the forest to the west start advancing, while archers try shooting at each other across the creek. The Talapi are better geared and trained, so they do well, though there are still losses. To the west, the trees are too thick for the hybrid squad to shoot through, but their swords still cut through enemies and armor protects them from them. They keep hacking and slashing at the hundreds who show up, and in the end, only one of them, plus a few of the archers, die to accomplish this. It isn't the best, but as far as simple chores go, this was a good one. That victory does make another ally withdrawal. These ones do actually exist nearby, but we didn't really have them as an ally to begin with. We didn't trade, didn't protect each other, and now they're siding with the awful usurpators who have lived far too long. The archers still aren't trained enough to want to venture out, but by recalling them, telling them that they should only train to excellence instead of mastery, then sending them back out, more archers think they're good and properly join, and in total, more more than 200 march for the capital. Unlike other sieges, they have to fight off the garrison in an actual battle instead of just waiting them out. That should not be hard though. The enemy are poorly geared, and while they're well trained, they are all melee soldiers in an almost empty plane. The Talapi melee soldiers draw up to stand guard while archers behind them fire and fire and fire. To call this anything but a massacre would be a lie. Every barrage of arrows kills dozens. 
weapons. The enemy troops break and flee before they even have a chance to charge into certain death. In the end, this is a flawless victory. Beneath the most tilapi weapon available, against foes that refuse to use such things. Ironically though, the remaining 19 garrison members would apparently massacre the army that just killed over 500 if the tilapis charge the city now. Instead, they'll be sieged out for a single day, which turns out into a victory without losses. The capital of Usurpators is annihilated, leaving almost a thousand captives and tons of resources. A puppet government is installed, although perhaps that is not the best idea. Elias, the first puppet government installed in the south, wants war even though their army is pathetic, because they think we're a threat to world peace. It's clearly a desperate ploy to buy time Time for Usurpator's nobles who fled to their last town further west. They just barely got out ahead of the Tilapi army. They make people we thought were puppets defend them. With the capital of Usurpator's gone, the only way to ship things is is free, and we can resume imports they were stopping. Though with more than 4 million in the coffers after these last battles, I don't understand why traders weren't tripping over themselves to come from the east via the river. Really, what has that river even done besides make a little bit of land more fertile and give me ground to use a bad pun as I fish for likes on this video? At least now, we can import clothes these civilians are sorely lacking, while tailors produce solely for the soldiers' growing needs yet again. Furniture is going away too, as carpenters rush to make crude weapons for the hybrid soldiers still home in case the Elias army comes. Fortunately, they're frozen in fear despite the strong-handed declaration of war, while Talapi soldiers head west for the new capital. Oh, now they want a truce. They oppress and they exile, they send thousands of troops, and now that we're at their door, they want peace. Sure. Sure, this is just a peace army marching in. They're here to make sure the last annihilation wasn't too rough on y'all. Let it arrive. The army leaves nothing in their wake. The city of Jandra, which is where the former capital of Usurpators was, has zero people left. Annihilate really does mean annihilate. The city's burning scent still reaches the nobles at their new home, as soldiers finish marching on only G... Uh, only G as they finish marching on the city. I think we will declare war and start to besiege them. Their meager army and garrison ride out to try and break it, and while Auto Resolve would do a fine job of this, I think their last little hurrah deserves to be seen. They're weak, poorly trained, and geared even worse. Tilapi archers line up, and don't even give them a chance to raise the white flag before their volleys strike true. There are no survivors, and Tilapi march over the corpses towards the city proper. The nobles that caused all of this five decades ago are there. The magistrate that originally exiled the ten city founders is finally being brought to justice. Puppet states let people flee, and so the last bastion of usurpators is annihilated to the last. They, like all future enemies of the Talapi, are no more. Back home, this victory calls for celebration as the end of the fifth decade nears its end, and so the city finally starts to stop focusing on wars. Carpenters return to making furniture, which is given to the citizens, though not the humans. Only the Talapi get such luxuries that always should have been there. It's not like more weapons are needed to crush the little army of forces like Elias, who are almost incidentally conquered by archer fire as the army heads back home. Playing to a race's strength like Tilapi Rangers seems so incredibly strong in this game. It helps that enemy forces don't seem to concentrate their gear, and the AI doesn't charge enough, which really lets archers just tear through them. The army finally returns home after a campaign that lasted almost three years, but they do so victoriously and to great applause. The last war prisoners go to the massive set of dungeons, but they will only be there until there's room on the executioner's block. Civilians are going to be filling the air with wondrous applause and parades for a long time. Thank you again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. 
click my link in the description to grab your bonus and to start your free journey behind the engine of their more than 2,000 vehicles today. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. If you did, drop it a like to help me out and to convince YouTube that it's pretty alright. Songs of Six is absolutely amazing and I hope I've shown off at least some of that. I had more fun designing this city and the various rooms in it than I've had in almost any other city builder. The depth of the game, the balancing and how finely tuned it is, the modularity of city design, and the diversity of the races that come into play to wrap it all together make this a truly wonderful experience that hits a lot of itches just right. I'm going to be visiting some other games on the channel, but I'll definitely be back in the future once more updates arrive. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of it.